We can be. We must be the first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. Where no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world where no child has to die from diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if half the world is back. We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone, heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where economies prosper and new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry our infrastructure and our best innovations are not just used to make money, but to all make all our lives, lives better. We will live in a world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated inside our countries and between different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe and progressive and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume. Planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the threat of climate, climate change. Where we restore and protect the, the life in our, our oceans, oceans and seas. <laughs> we'll restore and protect life on land. The forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. We're all countries and we their people work together in partnerships of all kinds to make these world world goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations Global Goals for Sustainable Development. Let's, Let's get, get to work. work. Let's make it happen. Every day, peacekeepers help bring peace and stability to war-torn societies around the world. I invest in peace by supporting mine action in Cyprus. I invest in peacekeeping by saving people's lives. I invest in peace by protecting children in armed conflict. I invest in peace by facilitating dialogue in between different ethnic communities towards their reconciliation. By making sure that the UN gets to the places where no one else can go, as well as conducting patrols. On the International Day of United Nations Peacekeepers, we pay tribute to the more than 3,500 peacekeepers who have given their lives in the service of peace since 1948. Their sacrifice only strengthens our commitment to ensuring that United Nations peacekeepers continue protecting civilians in harm's way, promoting human rights and the rule of law, removing landmines, advancing negotiations, and securing a better future in the places they are deployed. Now, more than ever, it's essential that we continue investing in peace around the world. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning again. And uh, it's my great pleasure in a moment to, um, to welcome and invite our Foreign Minister, the Honourable Julie Bishop, to give our keynote address for the conference. At the outset, Minister, I just want to say that uh, we so appreciate uh, you coming here today to do this. And I know that you forwent the opportunity to get home <laughs> before going to the, uh, the GA. Uh, in New York, and so we really do um, uh, appreciate this. Um, and I think that I speak for all Australians, if I ever can, if anyone ever can, to say that um, whilst there is a lot of political angst in Australia, 
at the moment. Um, I haven't ever heard anyone say that they didn't think our foreign minister was doing a great job. And uh, it, it's nice to know that you're at the helm. The, the two short videos that we just saw, uh, one on the SDGs and the other from our new Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, were deliberate to show the linkage between peace and security and peace operations and the SDGs, because SDG 16 is all really about that. It's going to bring, help bring that together. And this was one of the key things that was missing from the Millennium Development Goals. Because obviously, unless you have SDG working, SDG 16 working, then we won't have that sustainable peace that we really want. And we did a conference the other day, a round table on SDG 16, and hopefully we'll be able to include some of that work in uh, the publication that comes out from this conference. I just very quickly want to reflect on something that Dr David Horner said about the golden age of peacekeeping. In 2003, I think it was, after I'd retired from the military, I was in Melbourne, I was running a, a on a visit, uh, I was running a, an NGO by that stage in Sydney, Ostcare, and uh, my driver happened to be, uh, the taxi driver happened to be from Somalia. And I said to him, oh, where do you come from? And he said, uh, by Doha. And I said, oh, didn't Australians go to Baidoa, you know, some sort of peacekeeping mission, not letting on that I knew anything about it. And he said, yes, that's why I'm in Australia. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the Australian battalion gave us such great security. They even patrolled at night time <laughs> and kept us secure. So when they left and handed over to another battalion, that didn't happen. And so my father said, we're going to Australia. <laughs> and, and after spending time in a refugee camp, uh, they actually arrived in Australia. The UNAA, as you'll see from the, uh, our sponsors at the bottom, uh, the UNAA has a very close relationship with the Australian government. And in fact, this conference wouldn't have happened without the sponsorship of DFAT, Defence and the AFP and we're very indebted. This doesn't mean that we go out preaching everything they say. We have some robust discussions. But it is actually, I think, a demonstration of true democracy when NGOs such as ours and the government can work very collegiately together on many issues and honestly say where we don't agree on issues. And for me in UNAA, as the fairly new president, only about a year, I have to say, I really, really appreciate the close relationship minister with DFAT because it is outstanding and uh, we work very closely together. Now, Australia has provided some wonderful force commanders uh, and some wonderful police commissioners. We have wonderful people in the United Nations at various levels. We even have a USG uh, in the Secretariat at the moment, which is wonderful. But where the rubber hits the road in the field, we've never provided a special representative of the Secretary General. So just like hopefully we'll get on to the Human Rights Council if our campaign is successful, hopefully one day we'll have a special representative of the Secretary General as well. Now before asking the Minister to come up, I'm compelled to just read a short little little part of a speech. Earlier this year, I was um, lucky enough, fortunate enough to be in Brisbane when the Queensland Division of UNAA held their annual march and gathering on Peacekeepers Day. And uh, one young lady who I hadn't previously met, Louisa Ryan, was home on maternity leave from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And she gave this most moving speech that took me quite unawares. So the other day I contacted Louisa, who couldn't be here because she's busily writing her PhD on DRC, 
uh, and said, can I quote some of what you said? And she gave me her permission. I want to just read this out because I think it says a lot about what happens in the field and about the people who work in the United Nations. So after talking about um, MINURSCO, which is the mission, and all the problems and everything else there, she asks the question, so what, what does all this teach us? Well, that the solution to complex conflicts is political. You can have the best guns in the world, but you can't force people to the peace table, especially if continuing conflict is in their interest or even if they just don't care enough about the conflict to act. Monosco recognises that the solution cannot just be military. The DRC has long been a UNPK innovation lab and the civilian sections have introduced wonderful protection mechanisms such as community alert network, community liaison assistance and civilian military joint protection teams. These were first tried in the DRC and have now spread to other missions across the world as peacekeeping best practice. Protection of civilians is front and centre for us. But there is only so much an international third party can do. We can't force a government to hold elections. We can't force them to pay their security forces so that they don't steal from the very people they're supposed to protect. We can't force them to make peace. Many people criticise the UN for many things. They have a point. We are expensive. MINURSCO costs over a billion US dollars per year. But the Congo is vast. It has no roads. And even that sum is a drop in the ocean compared to military action in Iraq or Afghanistan. We expect the UN to be all things and to do so much with so little. A minority of UN peacekeepers commit horrific acts of abuse. There is no excuse for this and we need to do better. But critics of the UN forget that the UN is us. The people who make the decisions and the rules are our governments. If we want peacekeeping to be better, we need to put it on our domestic agenda. Although this reflection has been pretty bleak so far, she's talking about the DRC, Holding my sky blue passport has been the proudest movement of my professional life. UN staff are my people. My heart broke after Haiti. I was sick after the deaths in Afghanistan. Yes, there are some useless UN staff who seem to be impossible to fire. But for everyone resting on their gilded UN sal salary laurels, there are five more who don't leave the office till 10 p.m. For every one who has unbecoming conduct, there are 10 more who spend their free time doing charity work. For every one who spends all their time at work organising their next R&R, there are 20 who consider the betterment of the lives of the Congolese their personal mission and spend every waking moment trying to figure out a better way to help. Some even die trying. And then she concluded her speech some minutes later with these words. These are strange tensions in a strange but enormously rewarding life. There are many drawbacks to peacekeeping, political, practical and personal. I'm currently on maternity leave and I'm not sure if I'll go back. Kinshasa is a family duty station now, but I'm not sure it should be, especially with the oft postponed elections coming up. The thought of being stuck at work on one side of town while my daughter at the other, if riots break out, is horrifying to me, but I'm lucky because I have the choice not to put us in that situation. A Congolese mother couldn't say the same. Whether or not I go back to Congo or perhaps somewhere else, I am proud to serve in a United Nations peacekeeping mission. 
I hope my daughter will be proud of me too. We may have our faults, but who knows how many more lives would have been lost if we weren't there. Even if I don't go back right now, you will absolutely see me back at my desk in 18 years' time when my daughter goes off to uni. It's where I feel I belong. I was so motivated by that. <laughs> and that replicates, for me, the many people in the field I've had the pleasure of dealing with. Um, Minister, I invite you to give us your keynote address. Thank you, Michael. That was a very moving tribute. I also thank you for your very kind words and I acknowledge the work that you do as National President of UNAA. Dr Brenda Nelson, my <laughs> dear friend who's looking after me with glasses of water, <laughs> the dreaded Canberra Lurgy. And I want to acknowledge Gary Quinlan, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and His Excellency Dr Marty Natalagawa, the former Foreign Minister of Indonesia and a very valued counterpart of mine during his term. Ambassadors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. This morning, I pay tribute to the United Nations Association of Australia for its leadership in Australia's debate on international affairs and in connecting the very many Australians who take an active interest in the United Nations. This year, we commemorate the 70th anniversary of our engagement in UN peacekeeping. On the 14th of September, 1947, Australia was the first country to deploy military observers to the Dutch East Indies as part of a United Nations Consular Commission. And I acknowledge the presence of a fellow West Australian, Charles Eaton, the son of Charles Senior, who headed that commission. These Australian peacekeeping pioneers monitored and reported on the ceasefire between the Dutch and Indonesian nationalists. Although hostilities resumed briefly in late 1948, the combatants eventually signed a United Nations mediated agreement on the 2nd of November 1949, which led to Indonesia achieving de jure independence from the Netherlands on the 27th of December 1949. Almost seven decades later, Indonesia has become a major United Nations peacekeeping contributor in its own right and one of Australia's most important friends and partners in the region. Peacekeeping is one of the approaches available to the United Nations to assist member states in transitioning away from conflict toward peace and the rebuilding of institutions that can provide security and effective governance economic development and social progress. In this sense, peacekeeping fulfills the core mandate of the UN Charter to discourage aggression, settle disputes without resorting to coercion or the use of force, and to achieve enduring peace and bring an end to war. Since 1948, the Security Council has authorised 71 peace operations to restore stability around the world there are 15 underway today across four continents. In 2016, the United Nations Security Council adopted 77 resolutions, many directing peacekeeping operations. Thus far, in 2017, it has adopted 37. Tragically, in that time, four vetoes have stymied the United Nations Security Council's efforts to respond to the terrible conflict in Syria. Yet the Council continues to drive peacekeeping in many places and, Michael, does it cost effectively? Last financial year, the UN's total peacekeeping budget was under eight billion US dollars. That's less than half a percent of global military expenditure. The United Nations has repeatedly demonstrated the value of peacekeeping missions. 54 have completed their mandate and closed. 
While peacekeepers can't be expected to solve all of a country's problems, and some peacekeeping missions have had difficulties fulfilling their mandates, the world would be a far more dangerous and brutal place without them. Peacekeepers provide a measure of stability that makes it easier for a country to return to political dialogue. They assist in the disarmament, demobilisation and reintegration of ex-combatants. They train police in restoring the rule of law. They provide logistical support that enables elections to be held. They can also play a role in the release of child soldiers. In fact, over 115,000 child soldiers have been released from serving military and rebel leaders as a result of broader UN efforts towards this end. Australia has played an invaluable role in peacekeeping efforts, having contributed troops and police in 62 peace and security operations, including 21 UN peacekeeping missions. From the Middle East and Africa to Asia and the Pacific, we have a proud history of peacekeeping and we honour those who have served and are currently serving. I congratulate the Australian Peacekeepers Memorial Project on such an impressive and permanent tribute that you have created in this memorial precinct. And I wish I could have been there yesterday. However, the Chief Government Whip decided that the numbers were too close in the House at that time. But well done. Few know better than our military, police and civilians who have served as peacekeepers the difficulty of United Nations peacekeeping operations and the terrible human price paid when national leaders and the international system fall short. In the midst of these painful limits and frustrations, many Australian peacekeepers serving with the United Nations have shown initiative and courage and selflessness worthy of the best Australian tradition. At times with little to draw on other than their wits and training and perhaps a medical kit, they have brought order to chaos, saved lives and rekindled hope. Australia meets our commitments to the UN peacekeeping budget in full and on time as the largest, sorry, as the 11th largest financial contributor. It's also gratifying to see that many countries that we've assisted are now assisting others. And as I earlier acknowledged Indonesia, which is now ranked 11th amongst troop contributors, I also acknowledge Cambodia, and Timor-Leste for their UN peacekeeping contributions. We value our peacekeeping partnerships with our neighbours and we can't rule out the possibility that we might need to draw on them in the future. We've had nine UN peacekeeping missions in Asia and the Pacific over the years, having just concluded the Australian-led regional assistance mission in Solomon Islands. Ramsey concluded in June this year, after 14 years. The Royal Solomon Islands Police Force is now deploying police as UN peacekeepers and its first contingent was deployed in August of 2016 to Darfur, Sudan. <coughs> Australia trains around 250 international peacekeepers each year and we're currently helping Vietnam prepare for its anticipated peacekeeping mission to South Sudan in 2018. Through our Defence Cooperation Program, Australia is providing specialist English training to Vietnam, along with equipment valued at about $400,000. Last month, Australia offered to provide strategic airlift to assist Vietnam to deploy its military hospital to South Sudan. In addition to funding, training personnel and logistics, Australia provides policy leadership and development in areas where we have expertise to make the United Nations more capable and efficient. We've gained valuable operational experience in our region during our missions in Timor-Leste, the autonomous region of Bougainville and Solomon Islands. We've worked hard to apply the lessons we've learned through United Nations resolutions and we've helped drive three important reforms now being integrated into United Nations practice. The first of these changes was to focus United Nations efforts from conflict prevention through to recovery and beyond on sustaining peace as we learned in our 14-year, $2.8 billion commitment leading Ramsey, building peace and preventing conflict requires sustained effort. 90% of civil wars in the years of the 2000s occurred in countries that had already experienced civil war in the previous 30 years. The number of civil conflicts taking place around the world tripled between 2007 and 2014, we must get better at making peace last. 
In April last year with Angola, we co-chaired negotiations on a resolution adopted by both the United Nations Security Council and the General Assembly in which the United Nations committed to integrating its efforts around the objective of sustaining peace. We support the UN's efforts to help countries emerging from conflict, including in our region, through the UN Peace Building Fund and the UN Department of Political Affairs. Now, the second lesson we took to the United Nations concerned the particular contribution that police can bring to peace building. The Australian Defence Force was an important presence in the first phase of Ramsey's deployment, although Ramsey was a civilian-led integrated security and development mission. Its longest running component was in fact operational and capacity building support to the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force. So for the last four years of its existence, from 2013 onwards, Ramsey was solely a policing mission. When police keep the peace, they can build the rule of law from day one. Rule of law is crucial to establishing a sustainable peace. And this principle was one of the reasons Australia championed a UN Security Council resolution on policing during our term on the Security Council from 2013 to 2014. And we'll continue to play a leading role in international police training and in promoting the further development of policing within the UN's peacekeeping policies. And in doing so, we draw on considerable experience within the UN system, including 53 years of continuous policing service in Cyprus, which concluded in June this year. Third, Australia has helped drive the UN's agenda on women, peace and security, and this is a particular interest and passion of mine, having witnessed the contribution that women can make, particularly in the Solomon Islands. Australia helped bring an unprecedented level of attention to this issue during our Security Council term, culminating in resolutions to improve women's participation in conflict prevention and peace building. Conflict prevention, peacekeeping and peace building and our approach to maintaining security and stability have evolved over the last 70 years and will continue to adapt. In fact, next week I will be leading Australia's delegation to the UN General Assembly Leaders Week and I will participate in the UN Security Council high-level debate on US peacekeeping. Um, the focus is on reform, uh, where I'll be highlighting our perspectives and given our experience, uh, particularly that peacekeeping must be deployed as part of a broader political strategy, uh, where the work of peacekeepers is supported by other tools like mediation, uh, humanitarian support and longer-term development planning. Today, our region faces a range of new challenges, including another watershed. The international community must find a way to walk North Korea back from the brink of its reckless provocations and illegal missile and nuclear programs. And again this morning, another missile test over Japan, which, while probably intermediate in its range, uh, travelled further than any of its previous 88 illegal missile tests. As these walls remind us, 340 Australians lost their lives in military conflict on the Korean Peninsula. The current situation is difficult and dangerous and threatens the stability of our region. Successive Security Council resolutions have focused the world's attention on this issue and the Security Council has resolved <coughs> repeatedly that North Korea's nuclear program is illegal and the members are united in condemning and sanctioning the regime's nuclear and missile tests. The sanctions agreed last Monday, together with the sanctions agreed on the 5th of August, are the toughest and most comprehensive package of sanctions imposed on North Korea to date, but they must be universally implemented in order to put sufficient pressure on North Korea for it to change its behaviour and to recalculate its risk. And North Korea is in direct and continued defiance of the UN Security Council. All members of the Security Council, particularly the permanent five who have a privileged position as permanent members, must uphold the authority of the Security Council and enforce fully its resolutions. Australia, of course, will continue to strictly enforce these sanctions and reinforce them with autonomous measures that we have also put in place. 
I have repeatedly called on North Korea to cease its illegal programs together with other counterpart foreign ministers and leaders and to focus its efforts and energy and resources to the well-being of its impoverished people. Justice Michael Kirby, the Australian Chief of the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea, exposed the regime's abuses in his official report to the UN that concluded North Korea is, and I quote, a state that does not content itself with ensuring the authoritarian rule of a small group of people, but seeks to dominate every aspect of its citizens' lives and terrorises them from within. There's little disagreement around the world about how this situation should end. One way or another, North Korea must abandon its illegal missile and weapons programs. The United Nations will continue to be the important forum for achieving this. One of the key messages of the Australian Government's foreign policy white paper that will be published in coming months is that in an increasingly contested world, the rules-based international order is vital for the pursuit of every nation's legitimate international interests. The United Nations, with all its successes and all its imperfections, sits at the heart of this international order. I believe Australia is a principled and pragmatic member of the United Nations, making concerted contributions which we think will yield the best results. And I'm delighted that we have an opportunity, should all those who have promised us support vote in our favour, to serve on the UN Human Rights Council from October this year. We'll continue to support the institution of the United Nations to strengthen the rules-based order, project our values and interests and solve problems that require the United Nations' unique legitimacy. Peacekeeping is a tangible expression of the international rules-based order. I salute all Australians and others around the world who are and have been dedicated peacekeepers to achieve that noble end. Thank you. Uh, Minister, thank you so much for that, uh, that great speech. I, I think as a keynote address for this conference, it's just perfect. And uh, I know you wanted to stay to watch some of the other presentations, but uh, strangely, you're um, in such demand, you have to go back <laughs> to give another presentation and, they're, and they've adjusted it. So please accept this on our thank behalf you. and thank, thank you, you very much indeed. Thank you. I wish thank you all the best for the rest thank of you. Thank you. Thank you. Just on good afternoon, it's hard to act, act to follow. Um, my name is Zenny Edwards and I'm the director of the UNA Peace Program. And I'm very glad and privileged to be here to participate in this forum. So thank you very much for asking me. Most of the Australians' public attention has focused on critical military contributions, but there are other services humanitarian services provided by organizations and private companies, such as Aspen Medical, 
that work in positions of influence and danger with their efforts largely unknown. This will be the subject of our next speaker. Bruce, started, Bruce Armstrong started his working career in the Australian Army. In April 2013, Bruce joined Aspen Medical as a chief of staff. In January 2015, he was appointed as, his, as the chief executive officer for the global operation spanning 12 countries and employing in excess of 2,000 employees. Aspen Medical is one of those very enterprising companies that do good without most people knowing what they're doing. So Bruce is going to speak about Aspen Medical being chosen to help rebuild Mosul's healthcare system as part of the global humanitarian effort in partnership with the World Health Organization. So please welcome Bruce Armstrong. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, you know, when you get asked to speak, I always go directly and have a look at the program. You think, I don't want to be the last speaker of the day just before drinks, and I don't want to, I don't want to follow a great speaker. Well, I wasn't the last speaker before drinks, but uh, unfortunately for me, I had to follow uh, Minister Bishop. And uh, in her absence, can I just uh, also just thank her for her fantastic leadership on the world stage on behalf of Aspen Medical. Uh, to those uh, here, to uh, General Smith, still outside, I think, but also to, um, to uh, the ambassadors, if they're still here, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here today and just to tell you about a story. I want to tell you a story about an Australian company, about where we've come from, and then I really want to spend most of my time telling you about what we're doing in Iraq at the moment in support of the UN and the World Health Organisation. And then finally, I just want to uh, contribute to the dialogue on the utilisation of the private sector uh, in, in, uh, in UN operations and defence operations around the world. I'll just... Uh... Sorry, there we go. All right, just a bit about us. Well, really, we're a diversified health service provider and we, we were founded in 2003. The thing I really want to tell you about is that we are a very proud Australian company and our global head office is here in Canberra, just over at Deakin. And, uh, and you heard that we do employ uh, circa 2,000, that goes up and down. The other thing about Aspen Medical is defence is in our DNA. Uh, we have uh, the two founders uh, came from the Defence Force. I came, I've uh, spent time in the Defence Force, I'm a veteran myself, and also a lot of our executive. Uh, but now, we're delivering health services around the world. So you can see up there that not only we support the UN, uh, but we support a number of governments around the world and other, other uh, agencies. You can see our area of operations. We really started, uh, well, we started overseas in the UK, but in the, in the main we started here, and our first mission, it was mentioned by the Minister, was Regional Assistance Mission Solomon Islands. And we were there right from the start when uh, that mission first started in support of the Australian Defence Force, providing primary health care, tertiary health care, and also uh, aeromedical evacuation medical support. So this is really why I'm here today to tell you about what we're doing uh, in Iraq at the moment. And I really, I want to make this a personal story, so there's a very short video that I want to show you at one stage. And I want to show you that because you'll hear directly from some of our people on the ground and uh, on the magnificent work that they're doing and that we're so proud of. And it's an international team. I'll give you some stats. Predominantly it's Australian, but we're also working with the Iraq uh, uh, Ministry of Health staff. Uh, all the ones certainly that I met we're out of Mosul and the fantastic work that they're doing and, uh, and we're, I'm personally proud of everything, every one of them, the staff that we have over there, including the Iraqi staff. Uh, just a bit of geography and, and look, most people in this room I'm sure are well and truly across where Iraq is. But uh, if I can just take you down to our area of operations for our support for the UN, 
Uh, we're in northern Iraq, and the two uh, centres that I'd point out on that map is uh, Mosul and Erbil. Uh, Mosul uh, is, uh, is really where we're uh, predominantly providing the services that we are to the World Health Organization and the UN, and I'll tell you, I'll give you a breakdown of what that is actually about. And Herbal is where we're, we're staging through uh, all of our people, and we have our, our operational project management office there. And for those who have been there lately, Kurdistan, I'd call it reasonably benign and relatively secure, although you've still got people with AK-47s on the front of your hotel, but uh, quite a secure area for us to bring our people through and then tr transition them out of Erbil, uh, sorry, Kurdistan, over the border and then uh, into the Mosul vicinity. Uh, most people, once again, there was, this was uh, received a lot of media and so we saw the terrible, terrible tragic circumstances of what was going on in that city. And, uh, and from first-hand experience, we know how terrible they are now. And I'll talk about uh, uh, how we're trying to take care of our people who have been involved in this. So what did we get asked to provide? So we were asked to provide by the World Health Organization a, a trauma hospital, uh, two trauma hospitals as it, uh, it ended up being, and for the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, we were asked to provide two uh, maternity hospitals. Uh, the World Health Organization trauma hospitals are, th are the primary structures and I'll show you some uh, footage of those. And, but, and we blistered on the side the UN FPA maternity hospitals. So the, uh, the facilities, um, so it was really uh, manned by international, but it was, it was run here and, uh, and the strategic, and I'll go into this, the strategic office that is running this is just over there at Deakin. So that's where it all started, that's where all the planning started, that's where all the risk assessment was done, and that's where the operation was launched from over there. But on the ground in, in the country, uh, we've currently got uh, two hospitals. Uh, the first hospital uh, at Atbar, just south on the uh, main supply route that was going into the conflict area, uh, was opened on the 24th of March. I'll speak a little bit more later on, but a large part of what we were doing was capacity building. I'm really pleased to say that we've now handed over Hospital One back to the, the Iraq Ministry of Health and they're running it completely themselves. And Hospital Two is very much still running, uh, running to near full capacity and that was opened on the 23rd of April. We were supposed to uh, open another uh, hospital at Telefar, and that was cancelled, and I'm really pleased to hear that uh, because it was secured a lot quicker than they thought. We're currently doing planning and planning for uh, uh, another two hospitals, north of Baghdad um, and south of the current area of operations, and we expect to have our first hospital opened in that vicinity uh, over the next week or so. So you can see some patient statistics there. These are, these are um, uh, in the main civilians, but I, I'd highlight that we did, we treated uh, ISIS uh, suspects. We treated also um, Iraqi um, uh, military personnel as well. But in the main, we were there and that's what we did treat. We, we treated the civi civilian casualties. Um, 8,990, I'm pretty sure if I asked uh, today, we'd be up just over 9,000. So it's a lot of people that were coming through a trauma hospital. And the age, there was a large spread of age there. Look, that picture there is a fantastic picture. That's the first patient that we saw. Uh, as uh, as said, that was a small baby boy suffering crush injuries. Uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, the thing I look at that, and that's a... Uh, that's one of our uh, Kurd uh, sorry, Kurdish um, security force staff coming in, holding up the, um, the, the, uh, the aid there, and, and that is a Sunni lady carrying in the, the baby. Now, I'm pleased to say that that uh, uh, young boy survived, so very happy about that. The injuries we were seeing there were, could only be described as horrific. Um, ISIS uh, was... Um, uh, shooting men, women, children, uh, babies, pregnant women, and uh, they're all coming through our hospital. So predominantly we were seeing blast injuries. Um, uh, we're seeing uh, uh, blast, gunshot wounds, crush injuries, uh, and there was a very small amount of chemical at one stage. 
Uh, I just wanted to show this very short video because it does, it brings it personal and uh, you'll hear from some of our people on the ground, including an Australian. Up at Athbar Field Hospital we have um, a trauma centre, so it's predominantly trauma that's coming through the doors. Um, we're seeing a lot of burns, a lot of traumatic amputations, um, a lot of blast injuries, a lot of gun gunshot wounds. Uh, really, we're, we're it in terms of, um, of, of the care that's available in, in and around Mosul at the moment. Yeah, got woken up at about 3.30 this morning um, for a call for three non-critical patients coming in. Um, then got a call again at 4 o'clock to turn up and we've had around about 20 patients through all of a sudden with blast injuries etc. Um, so we've just tried to manage a mass casualty. Basically what we have here is a seven-year-old Iraqi national uh, who was involved in a, an airstrike about six, seven months ago. Um, this, she had an open fracture of the mid-shaft of her left femur, uh, which was treated surgically in Baghdad. And our plan today is to take this external fixator off. It's been on for seven months. And, uh, so hopefully we'll take the frame off and the fracture will be stable and we can then take, take the pins out. That went very smoothly. Um, you see, there was, there was a lot of staff there, but um, it, I think, I think uh, it was a very straightforward operation. She'll, she'll get home today, and for the first time in seven months, she won't have a big fixator on her leg. So it will change her life. Uh, can he come into ICU? Yes, when she wakes, eh? Yes, when she wakes, eh? Very good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isam. Thank you.
very, very great challenge uh, was, you know, bringing two teams together, an international team uh, with an Iraqi team and the Iraqi team being an integrative, uh, integrated part of our system. It has come out very well, it has been a fantastic experience. We have become one team. We have achieved to build uh, two hospitals, yeah? They are the largest hospitals in the areas, the largest trauma units. Uh, with the highest standard. Yeah? And we never have done that before, Aspen never has done that before, but uh, we have done a marvelous job. We make a real difference here in survival of patients. Our mortality rates are lower than everybody or anybody expected it to be. We, we, it's less than 4% of all patients coming to us that will unfortunately die. So I think we do make a big difference and we have a big impact. Thank you for your time there. As I said, I think it's really important to hear from the people that are on the ground uh, delivering what I, I think is a magnificent effort. Um, and that was really in the international team that you saw there, uh, predominantly Australians, but the uh, last uh, doctor that you, you saw there, Marcus, who's our senior medical officer, worked for Aspen Medical long term and has just, just done a magnificent job in bringing the Iraqi and the international expat team together as, as, as he said, one team, which is what I saw when I was over there. I just want, was going to show you some footage, uh, some clips of the, the actual hospitals. They were a very high standard. Uh, great photo. That was the first baby born in our first maternity hospital. That, you know, that, was, uh, that caused joy all around the world at Aspen Medical. You know, I love that photo, um, uh, A, because we've all got our caps on, but, uh, um, but it's showing uh, in amongst the Iraqi clinical staff is all of our Aspen staff as well. So uh, a great photo. So look, just a bit about the project management. So as I said, this was uh, our strategic headquarters just over here at Deakin, the operational headquarters we set up in Herbal and the, of course the tactical sites throughout the hospitals themselves. Uh, over in the UAE at Abu Dhabi, that's where we, we had our support hub and we transitioned everyone from around the world in through there and they certainly, that's when they did their onboarding, um, uh, things like uh, mental health but also uh, just all of the other things and security, security uh, knowledge that they had to have before going into country. Uh, the expat team, it was about, um, uh, that was at the last, there was about 36% were Australians and the next uh, biggest contingent was British, there was about 20%, but then it really was uh, right around the world after that and you saw our SMO was from Germany. So we're always proud of uh, how quickly we can stand things up when we need to and we, we showed that in West Africa. But I'll just show you from here. So last year, the, uh, the World Health Organization went out to the EU and asked for responses to provide these trauma hospitals because they'd done their planning and they knew that there was going to be a large amount of casual, civilian casualties out of the Mosul offensive. And they didn't, they didn't get a response. Now, to put that in context though, um, Medicine Sans Frontier and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Red Crescent, Samaritan's Purse, et cetera, they were all on the ground already. And so it wasn't like they weren't doing anything. We, you know, we at Bass Medical have huge respect for all of those NGOs and we think we all play a part. Uh, but they, there was no capacity. And so uh, they, when they eventually sorted this out, that we got literally the late night phone call, it was in February, came through to us and said, well, can you put a hospital, a trauma hospital and a maternity hospital into Iraq? Now, we don't say yes straight away to those things. We, we need to do uh, all of our planning, so our risk assessment, etc. cetera. But, uh, and our first thing that we did do uh, before we had said yes was we sent our recon team into Herbal and we had them there within uh, uh, literally days. We sent someone out of the UAE straight in there. And then, um, and then it, was, it was pretty quick after that that we had the hospitals open. And, uh, and that, uh, that there, when we transitioned back to the Iraq Ministry of Health on the Hospital One, that was a great moment as well because we'd done our job in our capacity building and we're estimated, as I said, to, to open another hospital in the next week or so. I'd just like to finish by just making some comments about uh, private sector utilisation because I know this is a sensitive issue not only for the UN uh, but for the World Health Organisation, well, part of the UN, and also for a number of governments. 
So just by way of background, I believe there's a proof point here. And the proof point is that Aspen Medical has deployed on a number of missions, be they uh, defence. So we were on uh, regional assistance mission Solomon Islands right at the start. And, and right through competitive tenders, we stayed there until it just closed, as the Minister said, in June. So there's plenty of examples of the private sector being part of a community that is going to de deliver on a nation's objectives, whether they be humanitarian or whether they be security based. And we're finding actually that the governments are increasingly looking, turning to the private sector as part of their capability. Uh, whether it is uh, part of the national capability or whether it's because uh, they want to, uh, in, in the case of Minister Bishop uh, in Australia, they want to uh, generate an economy around having private sector delivering aid. And of course, we're seeing from the aid uh, and humanitarian bodies that they also recognise the value of having private sector involvement in, uh, in creating uh, increased value when, you, when we deploy into the country. There's some examples that I spoke about before of where Aspen Medical has been and who we've supported around the world. Uh, that, and that's the statement from uh, the Australian government from, from uh, uh, that was, uh, and that was under uh, Minister Bishop and then so they've certainly been engaging with private industry because they see that it, there is mutual benefit for all parties uh, not only our own government, uh, but also for the uh, communities that we're being sent into. So I'm just going to finish with why private industry and, and, uh, and uh, because I think this contributes to the dialogue that is happening both in the UN and certainly I've uh, just got back from New York a couple of months, well a couple of months back that I visited there and I'm trying to promote this dialogue not only with the UN but also with other governments and we're doing that also right in Iraq uh, with governments approaching us. They've heard about what we're doing and not only the Australian government but other European governments uh, uh, taking part in this dialogue. Well why private industry? And we were say because often, not always, we would have a regional presence and that's advantageous. Sustainability, um, uh, we are for profit and we, we don't resolve from that, but we, we would always say at Asp Medical, we put the patient first, uh, but we can, before, because we're for profit, we can sustain. So in West Africa during the Ebola crisis, uh, we were engaged by the US government, we did about 50% of their response, and we were engaged by the Australian and the New Zealand governments to do, do their response into Sierra Leone. And then when it started dropping off and the, uh, and the NGOs uh, were leaving, the UK government engaged us to take over from NGOs that had been providing their response. So we can give that sustainability. We can uh, do that often uh, in a more efficient way, uh, certainly for the Australian government on the West Af Africa deployment. Uh, we came in 25% under their budget. We're currently around 20% under the UN's budget in Iraq. And we bring the innovation that we, we deliver to all of our clients, our private clients around the world, we bring that to what we're doing. And finally, and, and one that I am particularly proud of what we've done in, in Iraq, we do that capacity building. And I think we leave a lasting legacy uh, that will stay in that country long after we've left. So look, in conclusion, there are multiple examples, I believe, of how uh, private industry has been able to contribute to not only the UN but other civil governments and what they do around the world. And the private sector is well placed to do that. And, our, and finally, and the primary reason I'm here is to talk about uh, what we did in Iraq. Up to now, I'm very happy that we've met the objectives that we've been given by the UN and the World Health Organization. Thank you very much for uh, listening to our story. I don't know if there's time for questions. No, sounds like I'm out of time. Thank you very much. You. I'm sure a lot of people will have questions. I have a lot of questions, Bruce. Uh, the recruitment process, for example, and, and uh, there was a statement there to say after they've been treated, they're sent home. Where is home? I mean, is there a home? to go home to. Um, considering there's 1.2 million people in Mosul, you've got a 48-bed hospital. Um, your, your video was very powerful. 
So thank you very much, Bruce, for, for um, your speech and your presentation. I think I will leave it to Matthew to close the day before lunch. Thanks, <laughs> Uh, thanks, Annie. Yes, uh, that's right. Thank you, uh, Bruce. Uh, so it is lunch now. If you do have questions for Bruce, you'll uh, have the, the next little period of time outside to do that. Uh, we'll resume at, uh, at 1.30. Uh, please uh, eat and be merry.